So glad you have a sense of humor. Yes, I think I do. You do. You Hello, do. entrepreneurs. Joe DeChara, CPA extraordinaire, coming to you live from downtown Beth's Page, Long Island, New York, for another amazing episode of How to Win a Business. And tonight I have the pleasure of, of chatting with Dr. Ruth L. Kennedy. How are you, Ruth? I'm good. So you're you're a very interesting woman. I'm looking at your your credentials and so first of all, you're a doctor. Mm -hmm. I like Dr. Ruth. Don't you like Dr. Ruth? <laughs> she has a, so much fun. <laughs> oh, yeah. So you do uh, impressions? Oh, I do. Yes, yes, yes. I actually, the teenagers, I do the Dr. Ruth show. <laughs> and we talk about the undiscussable, you know, religion, money, okay. sex, you know, those topics. They have so, fun with you. So <laughs> yes. Dr. Ruth Kennedy also does stand-up comedy. If you want to book her, you can uh, <laughs> email her. How do they find <laughs> So, so tell us a little bit about yourself because I need an education. You do something like organizational. I, I can't even understand this. Too uh, well, so I work with organizations, small, medium, and large, and I take their business strategy, look at it with them, ask them a bazillion questions, then help them create their people strategy. You can't do the business strategy if you don't have the people strategy. And not all CEOs and CFOs like that because that means they have to invest in their people using money because some of it's about succession planning, some of it's about development, leadership, whatever, a variety of things. And you want to make sure you have a more holistic approach. So that's one of the things that I do. Um, also, there is the piece of like Dr. Ruth tells the truth, which means I get to be honest with CEOs when they are real horses asses. Or CFOs. Actually, CFOs seem to like me. It's the CEOs don't like me <laughs> because I call them on the carpet about some of their toots. Yeah, and nobody <laughs> wants to be called out on their stuff. But to be honest with you, what I've learned is unless you have some humility, you're only going to go so far. Yeah, and I've met many a narcissistic sociopath toot. Yeah. And, but they're always the CEO. I've had some wonderful CEOs like Roberto Gozueta from the Coca Cola Company, who's fabulous. <laughs> Um, I've had an opportunity to talk to Jack Welch and to Larry Vosity. That was wonderful. Um, but I've also had some others, and we'll leave them nameless because they would be so fussy because they really weren't good CEOs. And their people let them know they weren't good CEOs. Now, the CFOs like me because I would be very practical in what I'm actually helping them build. I won't waste your money. I'll tell you what you need to do. You need very little training and more in-person development, more mentoring, more coaching by the boss than you need the actual in-classroom stuff, which CFOs are like music to my ears. Thank you. <laughs> so, and actually the program that I want to talk about, the executive acumen, really came, got birthed out of a conversation with a CFO and his concerns about business case development, business cases, do the... Um, People who get the bonuses, the incentive-based people, do they really understand the financials? And he asked me to do a needs analysis. I did. It crushed his spirit because he saw the data of where U.S. was and where Asia was and Europe was and Central South America. And U.S. was good. Europe lacked some things. Asia lacked more. Central South America lacked more. And then we basically, he was like, what do you do? And I gave him... A th a to three different alternatives. One of them was what became, which is now the executive acumen, which is a year long program. So you want me to talk about it? Uh, no, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got too many. I, uh... I do lots of things. I help with culture. I help with development. You know, it's funny. People in human resources get to be like peanut butter. We have to be good at everything so we can be spread everywhere. <laughs> So I, I like to find people to interview where I could personally benefit from, from you know, asking questions that have to do with me and my business. Does that, okay. Does that <laughs> well, all right, Joe, talk to me a little bit more about your business. Okay, so bringing it back to, you know, I, we work at Bedrock Business Builders. We work with the smallest of small businesses, people that start out in, in the Are negative. They -owned? Are they family owned? The, uh, some of them, some of them, not really too many family owned businesses, husbands and wives, you know, but, you know, we're, we're working mainly with startups. Okay. Oh, that's okay. my, that's my, the risk takers. yeah, my, my purpose in life is to help the people that nobody else wants to help really get them into business. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. And it's, it's been a, uh, you know, we started doing this about two and a half years ago, and it's been eye-opening how little people know about business. <laughs> and myself included, myself included, and that, that's what I want to talk about, because before I was pretty much a solopreneur. My mom worked for me at a very nice job that I created for myself. You know, I made a good amount of money, uh, and I didn't work that much. To be honest with you, about I worked about twenty hours a week, and I was like, "This is great. This How is you? I can- This is when you're a kid. No, you- oh, this is the last kid. 10, 15 years. Okay. Yeah, I decided to. You know, I said I don't want to work. You know, sixty hours a week and kill myself. I had a good uh, foundation of clients, not mm-hmm. too many, not too few. You know. We paid our bills and and I was happy. But one day I woke up and I said, you know what? I'm not <laughs> I'm not happy. I'm not getting fulfilled. I need to do something that's gonna make an impact. Okay. Said, How am I gonna do that? And I wound up finding uh, a niche with uh, women, brand new women entrepreneurs. That was my avatar because I found from my 30 years and experience, those were the people that listened. Where I got results from, they were happy. The work. <laughs> and, and I said, you know what? I want a thousand of these kinds of clients. The, the right. you know, mompreneurs, the the women that are just coming out of uh, corporate and they want to start a business, and that that's what we do. But the only way to do that was to have a scalable business mm-hmm. because I couldn't make a living uh, right. with forty seven dollar a month clients. That's right. Okay. So now this became a whole different uh, stratosphere for me because instead of, you know, crunching numbers, putting tax, now I got to talk to people. Uh That's right. I actually have one of my best friends is a relationship coach and she's part of my team. If you look at my email, I got the the team picture up there, Susan Shepard. She just popped up on my screen. Yeah, she's a, a relationship expert. Well, why, would a, why would a business owner need a relationship expert? If I didn't have her, we wouldn't be where we are. And our business is booming. Uh, thank God. You know, good. I, well, the only reason, and I tell my team this all the time, I said, I'm not bedrock. We are bedrock. There's mm-hmm. no way I could do this without them. That's true. So yeah, how, how do you approach, if I came to you, Mm-hmm. Or would you work with me knowing that, you know, I'm a solopreneur? Mm-hmm. From what you've said so far, the answer would be yes. If I didn't know you, didn't know anything about you, I would have to ask you questions. But I'm going to back up a step. Okay. One of the things that I've discovered in my career, and this started when I worked for the Coca-Cola company, I designed a program for them called the Profit Story, which was basically designed to help salespeople know how to go into the client and help them understand, is it, you know, do you need cans, bottles? What do you need? Is it juices? Is it soda? What is it that you need? And the program was designed as a two-day program with one day being the theoretical and the second day being like a game that we had put together where teams competed to understand more about how you sell the client. Well, I was asked to launch it in South Africa. And I asked a, a classic question, which do the people you want me to teach understand the basics of trade math? And they said, yes, absolutely. And I said, okay, if they understand that, then I'll give me 24 salespeople and we'll go from there. So I'm in Johannesburg. I'm in an offsite. Here I am with 24 salespeople. And here we are getting to the very first problem case. And I was up. And I'm like, yes. And the person says, Miss Ruth, I don't know why they always like to call me Miss Ruth. Miss Ruth, I don't do numbers. Now, what's going through my mind is your sales, you don't do numbers, this is not computing. And I said, help me understand, what do you mean when you don't do numbers? I just don't do numbers. I said, well, who does your numbers? And he points to somebody in the room. And I had enough wits about me to go, how many people in here are just like him that you don't do the numbers, somebody else does? Half the hands went up. And I said, all right, go match yourself with the people who does your number. And we're going to do this together. We're going to change it up. At the break, I went up to this man and I said, excuse me again, help me understand. You're a salesperson. You don't do numbers. I don't understand. Help me understand. He began to tell me story after story after story about, and I can just hear the educators about to gasp when I say this, 
the horror of math teachers who could not educate people who understand words with math as symbols. So they couldn't take the symbols and translate it to the word person. And he began to tell me some horror stories. And I said, all right, fair enough. And so we, I went through the rest of that class, but I began to be an observer of what I termed math phobia. In every place I went, I ran into math phobia. You could be a vice president and you don't know, you don't do numbers, don't understand numbers, don't understand PL, and why would inventory be important? <laughs> and so I began to try to figure out ways to do this. And one of the things I learned is people are afraid to tell you that they're math phobic or they don't do numbers particularly if they happen to be a vice president in Europe and everybody's counting on them. Oh, and I'm not just picking on Europe. It could be Asia, Central America, it could be America, it could be anywhere. And so I learned to try to find ways to educate people about the numbers in a way that had humor or had a way for you to privately with a coach understand things. And with the higher up you were, I typically went towards a coach. So you could lay it all down with that coach with what you didn't know and get them to put it all together for you. Now, so, so that's kind of the backdrop of it. So let's can, talk can I, can I stop yeah. you for a second? Because th this is one of the things that shocked me was the, that we call it math phobia too. We came, my, my team and I came to the conclusion, like these people are afraid of numbers They <laughs> don't want because we teach people. We teach people about their taxes. I just did a, a workshop on, you know, you got to you gotta know what's on your pay stub. You got to look at your tax. You can't just yeah, rely on but, but numbers are a symbol and they're they, a language unto themselves. If you're a word people person. People are afraid of them. They are. And, and so you got my attention. I'm like, I get that. People, well, people don't want to admit it. They don't want to admit it either. They don't want to admit it, but also it's a language unto itself. So I'll give you another example, not necessarily related to entrepreneurs, but it makes sense. So a friend of mine asked for me to work with her daughter who is in the accelerated program in high school and was getting D's on her papers. Now, this is somebody like a future scientist getting D's on her English paper. And I said, send me a copy of your paper and I'll tell you what's wrong. And I read the paper and I, and I said, let me come see you. And she said, all right. And I said, all right. I'm looking at your paper. It's a great paper, but it's a great paper. If you're writing for a scientist or a math person, it's a horrible paper. If you're writing for an English person and she was like, why? I said, because scientists and math people write from a calculation in terms of this plus this equals this. And that's what your paper read as. But for an English person, that makes no sense. They need the story. They need the crisis. They need to make sure everything is like intensified. And then they need the solution and they need the actions. That's the English person. And she's like, well, how do I do that? I said, oh, that's easy. It's called the motivated sequence. Here's the formula. Put your paper into the formula. You'll have an A. Promise you. She did. She put it into the formula I gave her. She had an A. And she's in college now. And she... When she's writing for a science person, she writes one way. When she's writing for an English word person, she writes another way. And she's doing great. But that's the thing. We have different languages and we don't bother to help people understand. So my role with a female entrepreneur or any entrepreneur is, first of all, let's do a needs analysis. Where are you? What do you know? I don't care. You know, we're equal here. You know, I, I know certain things. You know certain things. You got these gifts. I've got these gifts. So let's get down to brass taxes. What can you do? What do you know? And let's build from there. And none of us know everything. And that's the one thing I encourage them. You're never going to be everything. So I used to work for the Cox Communications. And they asked me to try to figure out why some of their franchises were thriving and why some of them were drowning miserably. Well, I did a needs analysis. I went around and talked to all these different franchise owners. And I found out one thing. You're an either or. You're either a business person and you're horrible at sales, or you're superior at sales, and you're horrible at the business side. So my solution to Cox was, it's very simple. You just have them hire the opposite of what they're not, and their businesses will thrive, because rarely is somebody good at both. You meet them, not often. So you know, when I meet people who are entrepreneurs, I want to get the lay of the land. Where are they? I have them take um, Gallup's entrepreneurial assessment, so we get a sense for where they oh, are. Is that the strengths finder? Strengths Finder is one, but they also have one for entrepreneurs. It's, I have to look up the name of it, but if you look There's at your site, you'll find it. We started, yeah, we started, first I did my own personality assessment 
and I was shocked <laughs> when we started using them for you know our team mm -hmm. members. But you and need one to thing. What, what I what I learned, what I learned was the reason why I stayed small, because I tried growing and I kept hiring myself. <laughs> I so kept, you stay small. I, oh my God, I keep hiring myself. That's why. Mm -hmm. So what you just said, you hire, and, and that's what we do. We got people that are great at, at a few things. They're mm -hmm. not great at and. And I, part of their job is to give me less work to do. Well, one of the things that I encourage people to do is what my dissertation was on, which is shared leadership. Leader, and, and it sounds like a very simple concept, and it is, but it's not applied well. So what I encourage people to do is know what your skill set is, know where you're, what you're good at when it comes to entrepreneurial competencies, then either partner with because you don't have the money or you buy or hire people who have what you don't have and you have a shared leadership team. So it's kind of like, remember the movie hidden figures and it was NASA and it was, they're trying to launch to the moon, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So that is a classic example of shared leadership because they wanted whoever's mind knew what to do to do it. And they didn't care your level they didn't care your status in life. They didn't care. They just wanted to know how to get people safely to the moon and back to, to launch that uh, from that. And so NASA is really known for the matrix organization. They're known for shared leadership. And the matrix organization means you probably have like five bosses. But in that shared leadership, in that matrix organization, you also know what to do, what to do and how to do. And you have the freedom to do. And that's exactly what you see in that movie. Now, is that something people feel comfortable with? Absolutely not, Ex unless you're a younger person. If you happen to be of a younger generation, let's say you're 35 and younger, you are really very comfortable with shared leadership. You're very comfortable building a team. You're much more comfortable. And the reason is you had to live it in school. Why Why is it that people would be like, I'm embracing it. I'm like, I'll... You but you're a different person than most people. We're taught that you can be the all in all. You have to be perfect. Nobody is perfect. Let's set you free from that. You're so you're saying, so when, when I was raised, it was, you got to be the leader. You got, you men can't cry. You got to be tough. You got to be in charge. And now they started teaching people. Oh no, that's not the way anymore. So let me give you let me give you an example. The so we're all surviving the pandemic. We're all surviving the pandemic. And you know what we don't like about it is we're isolated, we feel terrible. And I was gonna get this person off. We feel terrible about it. And what you hey TJ, TJ, can you ask dad to get off the phone? Okay, yeah. Anyway, so what you He's not off the phone. So the, this is the interruption part of the podcast, folks. We, it happens sometimes, but. All right. So what I know about the pandemic is everybody was, low, was unsettled, including leaders. Somebody sent me the clip of the Marriott CEO. And my mouth dropped and I was absolutely ecstatic. And the reason I was ecstatic is because that CEO was very authentic. He said, all right, this is the state of the business. This is the state of the economy. This is where we are. We're going to have to lay off people. Does that mean I'm happy? No. Does that mean I need your help? Yes. We're going to lay off a certain percentage and we want to make sure you're successful. So you help us to do that. What you need, you help us tell. You tell us what you need. This is what we're going to tell you. And he went on. Then he said, now, if you're staying, you're going to feel terrible. You're going to feel terrible because you're staying and they left. But let me just say, we still need your help. You know what you're good at, and we want your help with where are you best at, how to best leverage your skills, your knowledge, and your abilities, and you help us understand. Now, does, do many CEOs do that? Absolutely not. Did he lay it down authentically? Yes, because he was honest that we can't do it without you, the employee. Whether you're staying or going, we want you successful, and that's the clear message he gave, and I applaud him for it. Now, that's not true of all organizations. Here goes that phone again. Sorry. Um, some organizations, and, and I, I would tell you that's why one point by what is it? Um, one point five million quit corporate America 
is because they were working for narcissistic sociopathic freaks. Okay. You know, do I hate corporate America? Yes. Do I love corporate America? Yes. I love the good people of corporate America. I will put in a high five for Under Armour, their CEO, their COO. Those people are bending over backwards to make sure their people are successful. Marriott's doing the same thing. Fidelity's doing the same thing. American Express is doing the same thing. But can I say that about all companies? Oh, no. Will I name them? No, because that's my business. But I will say the ones who are doing well, I'm very comfortable because I want them to be acknowledged and applauded for their ability to care about their people. Now, let's go back to your small business. Those people who are, maybe it's a couple, maybe it's two friends and they've started a business. They don't know what they don't know. And that's why they come to somebody like you. So you can help them with what's their business plan. How do you price it? And that's the hardest part is the pricing. And you have to figure out the lay of the land. And so you need to know where do you go and who do you go to? And most cities have business development people in their city that offer programs on how to start up a company. But people don't know it or they're too embarrassed or they're too... You know what's interesting? And I say this all the time. Like the people who come to me, they know that they, they need me. Mm -hmm. They don't particularly know why. <laughs> they, right. All they know is they got to do a tax return. We do much more than just, the tax return. I tell them that's an end result. That's uh, numbers we put on on a form. It's a picture before, of something. And before that, we got to do the bookkeeping. Yeah. But that's you know that's boring to me. I'm like, yeah, well, that. I'll but, challenge you there. I'll challenge you there. But it's not boring. Numbers are data. Data leads to dialogue, and that's what you want. You want the dialogue. Yeah, I, I mean, boring in a sense that it's just, it's uh, grunt work, okay? It's for what we do, bookkeeping, you're taking a number, you're putting it in an accounting system, but the end result, what we like to do is look at the numbers and explain what's going on with their business and then why. And a lot of times it has to do with uh, their mindset, mm -hmm. their relationships, right? They didn't teach me that in CPA school. You know, they said it was cash flow and the balance. No, it has more to do with uh, how you approach your job and, and the people around you. And uh, business came to mind, Chick-fil-A. Mm -hmm. You know, I hear about them all the time. You know, the way that that organization's run. And when the pandemic started, they got they hopped right on it. They got the drive through thing like down to a science. They did. Another person that you probably don't know because you're not in the South is Biscuitville. I just met with their CEO recently. She was a keynote speaker in a group that I was with the international management um, consultants of the Carolinas. And she was talking about what she did. So that for us, the shutdown was in March of 2020. She, in the December time frame at Christmas, was her mind was going. By January, she was fully engaged. And between January and March, she had her whole organization, her franchise owners and their employees, trained and ready for bear. So they knew what to do if we had a lockdown. So when they had the lockdown, they knew exactly what to do. One, she also respected them in terms of what money they were able to keep. She didn't take away the money that the franchise owners were making. She encouraged them. She made herself available and open. Now, what's interesting about her is she happens to be the first CEO who's not of the family. This is a family-owned business, very successful in the Carolinas, but in more places. But, but she's the first to actually take that role because she had the qualifications to do it and they had a need for her. But she has brought them to a place of ethics. Not that they didn't have ethics, but she raised their standards because of her own history and her own experiences. She helped the stores look good. She shut down stores that needed to be shut down. She made sure people were trained and ready. And she's very vulnerable and, and authentic in her own way. And so that's what Chick-fil-A does. That's what Biscuitville does. And, you know, the way you treat people matters. And that is what leadership is about. Leadership sure. is about how you treat people. And if you treat them like crap, you're going to get treated like crap. If you let me, ask you, let me ask you something. Uh, so <laughs> in, New, in New York City, which I just moved out of Queens. I'm on Long Island now. But uh, in New York City, they hired, uh, they elected this mayor, Eric Adams. I don't know if you heard about him. 
I don't know him. I, I I don't know him either, but the, the short time that I hear what he's doing, I'm like, oh my God, this I think this guy's got something because he hired a woman uh, to be the head of the police department. So mm -hmm. never been, and she's never run a police department, but he said, listen, everything she's done, she's been successful at. Mm -hmm. And she's got the emotional intelligence. That's what he keeps saying. And yeah. he just said today, he said, listen, we are going to fill the positions with people that have the emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. Part of my, he goes, that's, if you're going to be part of my staff, you're going to have to have the emotional. He goes, I'm not looking necessarily for experience. Explain what, explain what emotional intelligence is. Cause some, some people are going to go, what is that? So emotional, emotional intelligence is basically a person's ability to read people, to understand people, and to communicate with people. Can handle conflict and can handle positive feedback and can handle whatever's happening. That's what an emotional intelligence is. It means you're comfortable in your skin, you're comfortable being who you are, and you're comfortable respecting other people's knowledge, skills, and abilities. Yeah, and, and I looked at it as the, they're not gonna freak out under pressure. Right. Exactly. They're, they're going to no matter what's going on, they're going to be, you know, they're going to be like the the foundation. They're going to be the rock mm -hmm. and people will people need that. You know, and I said that that's a leader. Mm -hmm. you know, that's a leader. But let, let's talk about, you know, and I've been telling small business owners for this for this for years. And I say you got to be the president of your company. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you're a one person show. But yeah. if you want to stay a one person show, I mean, that that's fine, but you're going to be limited. And the only way to, to get out of that is to start acting like the president of your company. Uh, was I on point with that or is that? Well, you have to be in comfortable being in charge, that this is your vision. You're the one who understands your vision better than anybody else. And you need to have relationships with other people. You need to have your lifeline, meaning the people you can talk to, be honest with about what you're struggling with, where you need help, you know, that. But you, you, so you have to be willing to be vulnerable. But to be the leader, you have to be comfortable. This is my vision. I'm going to activate against it. Yeah, and to, in order to do that, I've got to be accountable and responsible for it. You, you can't be a business owner without being a leader. Not if you want to have a, a a scalable business a successful business that's right you just you know and i've asked a lot of people this i said can i be you know have a scalable business and not be the leader because not everybody wants to be a leader right well i think it's the way we perceive what leader is um i recently was talking to a graduate student who was interviewing and she was like i don't really feel comfortable talking about my accomplishments and i said well that is wrong and here's the reason it's wrong it's wrong because you came here on earth and you have a certain knowledge, skills, and abilities, a certain wiring. Your accomplishments are merely a picture of how you executed against those. And that's all it is. Nothing more, nothing less. I have a different set of knowledge, skills, and abilities, and I'm executing in a different way. And when I tell my story about my accomplishments, it's different than your story. But they're still the same. They're still stories. They're still contributing to the world. And that's what we need. And so, you know, that's what I want entrepreneurs to think about. You're the leader. It's not wrong. You're contributing. Go forth and do good because we need you to. And that's what America was built off of. We weren't built off of corporate America. Mm. Nope. Not really. So, okay. What, what do or, I want? Or we built off politics, but we won't go down that path. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> so, I, I'm at a loss for words. I'm just, I'm thinking about all this stuff, but. What do you want to? What do you want to know about the the executive acumen program? Well, what what I really want to know is the people that we work with. They they come into us. You know, we have very educated, intelligent people that right. were in corporate America, let's say, or in academia, mm -hmm. and they come out, and now they want to start a business. Right. And they're, they're in shock. They're in shock because it's nothing, you know, when you're, we just start a small business, it's like you're in charge of everything. You're not in charge of a department. You're in charge of sales, marketing, accounts payable, accounts receivable. And it, it's a lot for people. Yeah, so how, how would somebody like not get overwhelmed? 
Is that something that you would help them with? Yeah, absolutely. That, 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 you that, help them understand what it takes to be successful. And you, and they, that's one of the reasons why I asked them to do the Gallup entrepreneurial, I can't remember the name of it, um, assessment, because it has 10 competencies that you need. And you want them to know where they are. And the reason I want them to know where they are is because the top five are your strengths. The bottom five, well, you need to find a partner, whether that you hire them or whether they're your buddy or a friend or a father or an aunt or an uncle. I don't care who they are, but you need to have that balance because you're not the all in all. Nobody is the all in all. So I want them to understand that. The other thing is I make sure they take assessments. To your point, you said you had to learn about yourself. Well, I want them to learn the good, the bad and the ugly. Why? Why do I need to know the good, the bad, and the ugly? Because we're all imperfect and you need to know where your chinks are and where when you're having a bad day coming, because you're going to have them, who you got to go to and where you got to go. And you want somebody to get in your face and say, no. And I have those people. I mean, I have people in my personal life that are my go-tos, but I also have business people who in my professional life are my go-tos who are very comfortable getting in my face and saying, you're wrong. You have an attitude problem. You're being snarky today. You aren't being customer focused today. You need to get yourself right. Go for a walk. I don't care what you do, but turn it around. I have You have to have people who are comfortable giving you feedback. And there are very few people in this world who are comfortable. Now, when I was seven years old on my seventh birthday, my best friend gave me stationery. And the stationery said the truth from Ruth. So I've always had that reputation from childhood. You ask, I'm going to tell you. So if you don't want to know, don't ask. <laughs> OK, I mean, there are people, leaders who have asked who wish they had never asked me because they went away devastated. Why? Because I said horrible things to them. No, because I spoke from the observation of the truth of which I see. And I'll tell you what I see. Does that mean I'm perfect? No. Does that mean I'm going to make a mistake? Absolutely. But I will also be comfortable saying I'm observing this. And this is where I think it's got an implication of good or an implication of bad. And let's talk about the cause and effect. Let's talk about those things. So, yeah. Would you consider yourself, because that, this is what I look for. I wanted, pe and I surrounded myself with people that tell me the truth. I said, mm -hmm. just, be, and believe me, we've identified a lot of stuff that I shouldn't be doing with people. I shouldn't be talking. We actually classify clients. And we're like, okay, Elizabeth's going to deal with this one. Susan's going to deal with this one because I just, you know, people can push your buttons and I still let people. <laughs> push my buttons well in the past i would just say find another accountant but mm -hmm. that's not a good way to run you know a, a larger business so we found ways to uh keep the client happy where i don't have to interact with them all the time yeah well so when would you, you call yourself a coach a because some of it sounds like what my coaches do for me you know, they're looking at from the outside and they're giving me, you know, this is what we see. This is what you should do. Some of what I do is coaching because you really can act. Coaches are people who partner with you. They go alongside the journey with you. But coaches are also the ones who are asking you questions so you can activate against your goal. Consultants, which is another part of what I do, is people who have to give you the template, the formula, the structure, the something, because you don't know what you don't know. And so there are times when I will sit with a client and I will write their pricing structure for them. I will say, this is your really? fees based. Oh, absolutely. I've done that twice in the past week. Uh, one person was a life coach, couldn't get it together. So I put that together. Somebody's a, a graphic designer, put that together for her. So I help them find people to do their logo. I help them do all kinds of things, anything. But you got to know, as a consultant, there are times that you got to be the doer because they don't know and you can't send them away as a coach to think about it or to figure it out because they don't know. Now, some things that you need to think about when you're starting a business are you need to understand your capabilities and skills. We've already talked about that. You need to know the product or service that you're going to do. You, you need to figure that out. You got to figure out to research the market. Who are the customers? Who are the competition? What's the industry? You're also going to need to figure out the capital needs. What's the expense it's going to take? How am I going to make money? What do I have? What can I leverage? You need to choose business partners. You got to have a lawyer. You got to have a CPA. You got to have a marketing consultant. You got to have a banker. You got to have those. You got to determine your legal structure. Is it sole proprietary? Is it partnership? Is it corporation? Is it LLC? This is why you people get all overwhelmed. My, my yeah. head is spinning. <laughs> well, I give you. I mean, I give you a checklist and go here. Look at this checklist. 
That's one of the things that I do for people is because they don't know what they don't know and you can't expect them to know. But you also give them tools like how to write a business plan. You do not put on this earth to, and you automatically knew how to develop a business plan. You need somebody to help you. And most states have a small business center where they will be that person, that group of people for you. They'll walk through what a business plan is and what it's not. I, I think and, they all do. Isn't that the uh, small business development centers? Because yeah, I, I went there. I went there 30 years ago and I did my first business plan. Yeah, but people don't know how to activate against that. They don't know these things. You and I know yeah, these things. Because yeah. This is what we do. But, you know, they it's don't free. understand. It, it's free, folks. It is. It is. It's free. You and know, they it, got great it, stuff. It, this is another thing. I just want to make this point because I, I have a, a client. He's uh, he's in financial distress. OK, mm -hmm. a lot of our clients are in financial distress and he's like mm -hmm. holding off and starting the business. And I said, when, when are you going to start this? He has a great idea. He's like, when I get some money. I said, <laughs> are you kidding me? I said, you know how many things you could be doing with no money to get mm -hmm. You could have a Facebook page. You could start getting, you know, it has to do with classic cars. And I said, you got to build, even if you had the money, you still got to do this stuff. You got to build a following, you know, so people get hung up on the money thing, right? No, I, well, they do and they don't. You know what he, You know what your friend is telling me? He's afraid. He's very afraid. No, no, he's not telling me that. He's telling me he's a very afraid and I would be teasing behind. So what are you afraid of? You afraid of failure? What's the worst thing that can happen if you fail? Okay. All right. So you're afraid of, you don't have the money. How are you going to know you got that money? You know, so, I mean, this is a part of, you know, I tease behind the stinking thinking of fear because fear is your worst enemy. Faith is your positive hope. If you don't have hope, you can't move forward. If you have fear, you are going to tank yourself. You got to so get you're, you're Okay. So you just told me something that's going to help me a lot in helping him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I go after it, terribly after it. Yeah. And you know, you're right. When I call him out on this, he's not going to, he's not going to like it. Well, it's yeah. not a part of being liked. It's a part of, if you authentically want to be his friend, you're authentically going to help him. And you do I don't have a problem. With, I don't have a problem with people not liking me because I tell them the truth. Exactly. I've had to tell clients that they need to go get a job and shut the business down because after seven years, you're still losing money. Uh, you don't have a business. <laughs> <laughs> well, they didn't I guarantee those people having to shut their business down did not have the team around them to help them. Sometimes it's people who really work for them. And sometimes it's a board of directors or it's friends or, you know, resources that they didn't yeah. activate against. Absolutely. Every one of them mm -hmm. were, had no team. They do. They wanted to do everything. They, they're control mm -hmm. freaks. They knew everything. And unfortunately, I know <laughs> so the clients somewhere along the way. I mean, you, you can't I mean the only person who knows all is God. He's not he or she isn't. So therefore, you know, get off your duff and move on and ask people for help. So let, let's talk about this executive acumen program, because I'm reading it here. It's a leadership program for boosting executive level. And mm -hmm. let, let me just be clear. I think anybody that has a business is the if they're not the president of the company, then who is? Who's in charge? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So how, how does this work? It looks pretty interesting. You have a, it's a program, right? It is. So there, there are times that we need structure. And this is a structured program. It is held over a year. So there are four times where we would meet. And because of the pandemic, we've had to shift it around to make sure we meet via Zoom. Not my fave, but you do what you do. So the very first session we have, I really want to get into their financial disciplines, meaning I want to know what they don't know, and I want them to be okay with what they don't know because we can fill in the gaps. So for if I'm running things inside of a company, I have to help them understand the annual report because nobody understands it, reads it. Why is the words up front and they have numbers in the back? Why is it? <laughs> they don't understand that. Um, but when it comes to P&Ls and stuff like that, they need to understand the financial disciplines that it takes. But I don't want them just to sit there in that first session and all we do is talk numbers because they'd be snoozing. So we talk about numbers. We talk about conflict because if there's one thing that happens that where you see conflict the most is when you talk about numbers and money. 
So I want them to understand what is your conflict propensity. So I have an assessment for that so we can see where are you. And it's the strengths deployment inventory for those of you who are going, what inventory? So, so we, do, we talk about numbers. We talk about conflict. We talk about your skills. So I have them do the strengths finder. So I want them to understand who they are. I also put them in teams because I want them to begin to think, what is it like to start your business? So what's your one like? So I break them up into teams. So these are people who are in relationships with people who are not necessarily in their business, but they're other females who are learning to support each other in terms of their business. So they begin to look at the first year of a business and that's what happens in that first thing, the first meeting or training. So this is a group. This is a group program. It's okay. a group program, but it, you still have your individual part. So there is the component of in that first module where you understand the financials, you understand a business case structure, you understand what the first year of business is like. Then between the next in-person sessions or Zoom sessions, you are given a coach and that coach works with you to determine what it is is your goal for the overall year. And if we need to edit and change it, we will. But you begin to work with that coach and talk to them and begin to build your business and begin to think about things. Then we have the second module. And the second module is really much more components of the business case itself, where I get more specific about it. And then we work on year five. So we have a particular company that we work with as a model mock-up. And then in year um, in that particular module, we work on it's the fifth year. This is what's happened year one to now. And I, we want you to build a business case given the data you've been given for now. And they have to present it, talk about it. And when we present, it's not about competition. It's about giving feedback. So we have people who will give them the feedback on the good, the bad, and the ugly, what they're hearing. So then they go in between. They still have that coach working with them, still going against their goal. And then they come back in person or Zoom, wherever we are, and they do the third module. And the third module is beginning to apply the understanding of the financials and you're in year 10 of what you're doing with this particular mock company that we have. And so you can see they've learned about year one, year five, and year 10. And then they know that module four is about applying it to your particular business. So no matter the fact that you've been working in teams up to this point, on that final module, it's you presenting your business case about your business. But what we hope you've learned is networking, we, you understand your knowledge, skills, and abilities, your strengths, how to deal with conflict, how to build relationships, how to leverage the people in the room, how to leverage a financial person, how to leverage whoever's there that you need. But you have to present your business case and you present it to leaders in that particular city that we're hosting it in. And those city business leaders, they're business people, they'll give you feedback. This is not about competition. This isn't about winning money. This is about real feedback and real learning in real time. And they will tell you, what they saw were your advantages of what you presented. They'll talk to you about the limitations of what they heard. And then they will add to it in terms of given the advantages and limitations, this is what I would recommend you do. And so they're getting real live feedback on their business. And here it is a year. So this way I'm trying to prevent them from screwing up and messing up five years out and 10 years out. They get the information in year one or wherever they are. But in that particular year program, that's what they're learning. And it's exciting because they get to work with other people and see what that's like. So I, I'm looking at your flyer here and you got it laid out with the four different uh, areas. Uh, this sounds like it would be really powerful. Uh, it is. I mean, how many, people, example, how many I mean, people do you have in, in a, one uh, group? 20 to 24 in total. And really? the reason and the reason is the more the merrier, because I want them to be able to interface with a variety of people to see what it's like. And each time they get together they're I assign them to a different team. They don't get the same team. And if they're working with a financial person who happens to be there, the financial person is not allowed to do any of the calculations or any of the numbers. They can coach it. They can consult it, but they can't do it. And why do I do that? To frustrate them. No, I, I was going to say you're going to you you make people uncomfortable, right? You put no, them. In. No, I I want them to learn as financial people how to educate, how to inform, how to empower people who don't have the same skill set they do. Because at the end of the day, every business owner is going to have to understand the financials and have they're going to have to talk about it. And you know, you're going to be in trouble if you can. This is what I've been trying to 
tell my client, you know, I've had clients with five, ten million dollar year businesses and they don't even want to look at a balance sheet or a pay and out. <laughs> and it kills me. I'm like, oh my God, how you know I went to school for accounting because I wanted a $10 million business and I didn't want to have to ask somebody what was going on with my business. I didn't want to be an accountant. I wanted to know the numbers. Right. Yeah. Well, the reason I'm laughing is not to laugh at them, but it's to laugh with them in a sense of, you know, numbers, people get it. They love to look at those balance sheets. It means something to them. For those of us who are word people, which I am, I'm a word person that figured out the symbols. So the, what I want you to do is to find a good buddy. And that good buddy is going to help you learn to love your P&L. You're going to learn to love that balance sheet. And why do you need to love it? Because it is a picture of your story of your business. It's I all love, it is. It's a picture. I love what you said. You make the, the numbers are symbols. I love that. I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to use that. Okay. Go for it. <laughs> it's a picture. You, I mean, you think about it. The word montage, you think about everybody's business is a montage. A montage is a bunch of symbols and a lot of things and pictures that make up the story. Your numbers are a part of your story. You got to learn your numbers. You got to be comfortable with your numbers. Why? Because you're good at numbers? No, because they're a part of the story. It's like making a cake. If I'm going to make a cake, which I make lots of them, but if I'm going to make a cake, I use numbers. I have to have a measuring cup. I have to have measuring spoons. I can't just throw it together and there's a cake. There's a formula. So mathematics and those spreadsheets and those balance sheets and all the PL, all that is, is it is the calculation or the ingredients that are going to make you successful or unsuccessful. You're either going to make that business or not, but you got to put the data in, you got to put the ingredients in to make it a success. Not complicated. It is not complicated. People complicate it because of what? Fear. What is fear? False evidence appearing real. Mm. False. This is the second time I heard that today. <laughs> but it's because we, well, I'd like to point out our media people, whether it's social media or the TV people, the cable people, I don't care, NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, it doesn't matter. They are driven by fear. Why? Because it makes people to come back. Why? Because they think they've got everything in the know. It's an illusion. Get over it. Yeah. Drop it. Get it. Stop watching the news and go find people who know what's really going on. So, for example, um, when we had the crisis about the meat in the U.S., I had a friend who, was a, who owns cattle in the Midwest. What did I do? I got on the phone and I said, hey, Jeff, is it real or is it not real? Are we really having a meat crisis or not? And he goes, we're not having a meat crisis. We're having a political crisis. It has, nothing <laughs> to do with it. it has everything to do with supply chain and the two companies that we sell through. And those two companies are at war with one another. And that's what it is. And nobody bothers to figure that out unless you get on the phone and ask. And I'm sorry, I get on the phone and ask. I skip the politics of the government because they're only going to impact my life about 5% of the time, if that. So I drop them. They're drama people. They love their drama. Let them love their drama. So I go to the real people because the real people know. Yeah. So listen, I try to keep these to like 20 minutes or less, but this has been so interesting and I, I got so much information. I really appreciate that. How, how do people get in contact with you? How would they sign up for this uh, program? The best way to do anything with me is send me a text. That's the fastest way to get me. And the number is 336-403-4880. Can I put that in the chat here? Yeah, absolutely. Text. Just send me a text and say, I heard you on and tell me your name and we'll schedule some time and we'll talk. And I'll give you 30 minutes free for consulting every okay, time. What, what was that number again? 336 403-4880. Okay. Just tell me, I'll give you 30 minutes of my time. You just tell me what you need. And if you have the program's yours, we'll talk about it. If it's not, we'll talk about something else. Okay. I love that. Text Dr. Ruth Kennedy. You're welcome. Hey, one other plug I have. I have one other plug. Okay. So I believe in the numbers, but I also believe in people's ability to take care of themselves. So in 2022, I'm launching the EFA, which is a Celtic word for beauty, joy, and radiance, the EFA Wellness Retreat. And it is a three and a half day program that's in person. I'm launching it at the Grove Park Inn in Asheville, North Carolina. We're going to blend content with play. And the goal is to take the very stress from the mundane of the crap we're living through. And we're going to give you playtime. We're going to give you resources from 
people to help you with the physical part, whether it's doctors or physical therapists or massage therapists, to people who help you with understanding the mental stuff, the trauma, the numbers. I have a finance person coming and I also have stuff to talk to you about the spiritual. So it's looking at your whole life and how to put it in a balance and a better rhythm to have a better life going forward. So that's what we're doing in 2022. Okay, wait. So you just brought up, uh, we could do a whole another hour and a half. We on could, that. we could. Are you saying that your personal life is somehow connected to your business life? Absolutely. Okay. That's what, <laughs> Absolutely. That's what I figured you can't out. Separate them. You can't separate them, but I will help you put it into a balance. I get not, and when I say balance, I mean, let's get your rhythm. My rhythm and your rhythm are different. We can get you in the rhythm of your life and your business and give you a life with your business. I love that. Yeah, I woke up one day and I said, wait a second, we're just focusing on, on clients' businesses. I said, what if they make a lot of money and they're not going to know what to do with it? They have no plan. You know, people, they, they get money, they spend it, they, mm -hmm. and they're like, oh, why am I broke again? Yeah, because so started, you have a plan. <laughs> yeah, we started looking at their personal finances because they said, you know what? this is They don't know to ask us this stuff. That's true. Yeah, it's what they don't know what to ask me. So I got to tell them what to ask me. But it's true. Yeah. So this has been great. I'm just putting in your your website. It's Kennedy Dash Institute. Yep. Right. And yep. So the name of the company is the Kennedy Institute for Leadership. So you can certainly Google it. That's for sure. Kennedy Dash Institute.com. And uh, any parting words of wisdom? <laughs> Any parting words of wisdom? Yes. My parting words of wisdom is people are not successful because they migrate towards what people tell them to or what they think are the cool, hot things. People thrive and have a happy life when they take what they really love and they connect their work to what they truly love. So that is the biggest thing. We're all motivated people to pursue stuff. And a plan is a part of that. And that's a good thing. But you also want to make sure you are doing what you love and you do that by supporting your values. And a plan is a part of that. And I love to help people figure all that out because I love to maximize people's potential. And I do that by helping them know who they are and where they can go from there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Ruth. And yeah. Can we get a short uh, Dr. Ruth? thing again oh you want the parting dog truth okay. okay here's the deal it's a christmas time so we want to celebrate christmas we want to have a good time so you find a way to celebrate if you don't i'm gonna come back to you and say stop it you're thinking of thinking of you got to have a life have a life okay, <laughs> Till next love time. It. <laughs> see you love it okay we'll have you back again that's our story folks we're sticking to it uh see you again shortly god bless good night and thank you